First John chapter 1 is where we start, obviously, as we begin a new book study together. If you take a Bible from one of our ushers, it's page 1195 in those church Bibles. Page 1195. Now, uh, sometimes when we start a new book, and this is going to be the case with First John, even though this is a tiny book, it's only five chapters, and then it and then it gets even tinier with Second John and Third John and Jude. They're only a chapter each. Um, is is taking time to give an introduction, and it just so happens that this particular book it needs a little bit lengthier of an introduction, even though it's a tiny book, uh, because of what is happening in the first century when. John writes this. So I'm going to give an introduction, and then we'll pray, and then we'll see if we can get through chapter 1 tonight. But for you note-takers, this is a book that bears the name of John in the title, and so it was written by him around 85 to 90 AD. Uh, John's pretty old when he's he's writing this. Uh, He was the youngest of Jesus' apostles. He may have been uh, anywhere between late teens and early 20s when he was a personal follower of Jesus, uh, making him around 80 years of age at this particular time that he writes this book. So he's going to be the last of the surviving apostles, and um, and in his old age, he he pens um, some of these final uh, epistles here. Now, The name of John only appears in the title of this letter. Nowhere does John identify himself. And and yet there is evidence that he is the writer. So you have some liberal theologians who will say, we don't really know who wrote the the letter of 1 John. And so even though this book does not bear his name, he doesn't, you know, like a lot of Paul's epistles, he begins or ends by referring to his own name. John doesn't refer to himself in this in this letter. Uh, That's probably because when you were the last surviving elder, you don't need to identify yourself. Everybody knows at this point. But nevertheless, I'm going to give you the historical reasons why uh, we can be confident that this is uh, attributed to John as the author. Style, substance, and sources. Those three words. First, style. Uh, At least um, 10 identical phrases that appear in 1 John also appear in the Gospel of John. So there is a style similarity here between 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and the Gospel of John. And we do know that the Gospel of John was written by John, and so the similarities of style certainly indicate that he is the author. When it comes to substance, we find out in the first verse of chapter 1 here, when we, when read, it, when we read it in a little bit, that, that John refers to himself as the eyewitness, that he was there to see these things. He was there to behold these things, to to touch and and to be a part of this as a personal eyewitness. And since he, again, was the oldest of the surviving apostles, uh, this puts him as um, that eyewitness. So substance tells us that it's John. And then finally, sources. Uh, The early church fathers all agreed. Uh, Irenaeus, uh, Origen, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, all the early church fathers attributed this letter to the Apostle John. Uh, one of the things that I love about this letter, so, so that's settled as, as far as I'm concerned, although, you know, his name's not mentioned. Um, one of the things that I love about the uh, epistle of John, the first epistle here, 1 John, is that he is one of these guys who for thick-headed people like me um, explains himself very, very clearly. Uh, reading comprehension was not my best subject in school. I, I have to read things and reread and reread because what happens is my mind drifts. And I can read a whole page of something all the while thinking about entirely different things and realize I didn't understand a thing I just read. Can anybody else uh, relate? I, oh, oh, thank you. Wow. I don't know if you're just doing that to make me feel good about myself or if you really have the same problem I do. But I'm going to start a support group. But anyway, um, and it looks like there's a lot in the group here. So one of the things I love about John is for people like me, he spells out four purposes for writing his letter. Four purposes. Why did he write this letter? And he's going to tell us. The first 
is to make our joy full or complete. And I'm just going to take you through these verses so you see just how plain this is. So chapter 1 in verse 4, where he says, And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. Doesn't he spell that out for us? He says, here's one of the reasons I'm writing this epistle to you. I want, in your relationship with Christ, I want your joy to be full. I want it to be complete. The second reason, another reason he says he writes this, is to warn us about habitual sin. Look at chapter 2, verse 1, where he says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And so again, he spells it out for us. Now, we're going to see in a moment that this does not mean that Christians don't sin at all. But again, I use the word habitual sin because he's talking here about as believers. It's not that believers are sinless. It's that as believers, the older we get in Christ, we should sin less. All right, everybody understand that little play on words? And so one of the things here that is problematic in the life of a believer is when we still live like we used to live before we became a believer. And so that's inconsistent. So he writes, another point of his writing is, be careful of of habitual sin. That is not a characteristic of a follower of Christ. Number three, he tells us also plainly in this letter, I'm writing to refute false teachers. Look at chapter two, verse 26. Chapter two, 26, these things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. So again, it's just very plain talk. These things, another reason that I've written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. So he he writes to refute false teachers. And then finally, uh, number four, he writes to assure us of our salvation. Chapter five, last chapter, verse 13. Again, he just spells it out very plainly to us. Verse 13, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So it's it's intended to be a letter of encouragement. Now, I will tell you that when you read first, I remember the first time I read it as a young believer, as a teenager, and I thought to myself, when I got through reading 1 John, I ain't even saved. Because the way he writes about if you do this and you do this and you do this and you do this, you can't claim to have fellowship with the Lord. And I and I was doing this and I was doing this and I was doing this and I was doing this. So I was really like, I I don't think I'm even saved. He actually writes to assure us of our salvation so that by the time we finish the letter, we will be more secure and confident in our walk with the Lord. But it is a challenging letter in that it is going to confront us. It confronts us with sloppy Christian living. And it's going to challenge us, these are the kind of things that you should do as a believer and should not do as a believer. And um, one of the things and, and, and that stands opposed to Christianity in this particular time that is important for us to understand the background of this story, which is why I'm spending a little bit more time with this introduction, is, is Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a, a heresy that took root starting in its infancy in the first century A.D., which is when uh, John is writing here, just at the end of the first century, 85 to 90 A.D., uh, and, it, and it really becomes a stronghold in the second and third centuries A.D. So, I mean, for a couple hundred years or so, Gnosticism was a heresy that infected and affected the early church. So what is Gnosticism? I'm, I'm going to explain what Gnosticism is, and then I'll, on the screen I'll just give you a summary. But first let me just basically explain what it is. Gnosticism is from the Greek word gnosko, which means knowledge. One of the things that this heresy that crept into the early church that, that some of the early Christians thought or believed was that knowledge was the way to salvation. It's about what you know and not necessarily who you know. So if we can accumulate knowledge about these things, then that's the key to salvation. But the other important thing about Gnosticism that was really the the evil behind it was this thinking that things physical, okay, as it relates to physical body and tangible material things, that's really what is evil. So the physical is evil, the spiritual is what is good. And for that reason, the early Gnostics believed 
that Jesus was not really physical because they thought everything physical was fleshly and thus evil, and so they dismissed the physical incarnation of Jesus, God coming in flesh, and they believed that Jesus was just a phantom spirit, that he was walking around, he wasn't real flesh, he was just phantom spirit, which, which is completely contrary to Scripture because, you know, he became flesh and dwelt among us, is what, you know, John writes in his first gospel. So, you know, we beheld his glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He, God became flesh and dwelt among us. And so he does take on flesh. He does take on skin, so to speak. He wraps himself in humanity. Humanity, it's flesh itself is, is not sinful. It's how we operate in the flesh that is sinful. So the fact that Jesus had a physical body did not make him sinful because he, he was tempted in every way as we are, yet was without sin is what scripture says. So it's not that the physical or the tangible or the material is sinful in and of itself, but the early Gnostics thought that. So here's where they went and they're thinking with that. If therefore, everything physical doesn't matter, that it's only about what is spiritual, then you can really, this is what they taught, you can really do whatever you want physically because that's not what counts, it's only about the spirit. You see how twisted this gets? Which led then to this sloppy living in the early church where people who bought into Gnosticism then began to believe, well, if it doesn't really matter what I do, then my behavior really is not an indication of my Christianity or the lack thereof, so I can do whatever I jolly well want to do. And they were engaging in all kinds of sin and all kinds of practices because they were using the physical to gratify the desires of the sinful nature and to live lives like they weren't saved. And so John now, as Gnosticism starts to take root at the end of the first century, it's just, it's just in its infancy, but John is addressing this in this first uh, epistle here, 1 John, because it's going to take root in the second and third centuries, and it's going to wreck a lot of people in the early church in terms of their faith, because they don't have a proper understanding of who Jesus is. If you deny that, that God came in flesh, you're denying the incarnation. You're denying the whole, you know, uh, virgin birth. You're denying God in flesh, okay? So, so you're denying the authenticity and deity of Christ who takes on flesh and dwells among us and dies for our sins. And on top of that, you're compounding that false doctrine. If, if you don't believe that Jesus is, you know, come in flesh, then you're, you're living in false doctrine, but you're compounding that by saying, well, the, the flesh doesn't even really matter because once we get saved, it's all about the spirit so you can do whatever you want with your body. That's what's happening here. Okay, so that's, that's the main backdrop. Now, just to kind of summarize all that I just said there into a few couple of sentences here. Gnosticism was basically a heresy of the second and third centuries AD that started in the first century AD, which taught that one, all physical matter is evil. Therefore, Jesus did not have a physical body. He was a phantom spirit. And number two, since only the spirit matters, anything you do physically doesn't matter. So that's what Gnosticism teaches. That's what a lot we're buying into. And John is spending his time primarily, and as he writes first John, to, with that backdrop in mind, addressing some of the problems that were prevalent in the church. But here's the thing, you know, e even though Gnosticism is not an issue today, per se, um, we can still get into that kind of sloppy living where, where we just start to think, you know what, it's all about, you know, your spirit and going to heaven when you die and we're going to shed this body of flesh anyway, so does it really matter what we do with our bodies? It's not really about the body, you know, for, from dust we were created and to dust we shall return. And then a lot of people just get um, really lazy in, in their spiritual disciplines and living for Christ and not gratifying the desires of the sinful nature and dying to self. You know, all, that's a whole part of the Bible that relates to us as Christians about dying to self, taking up your cross daily, you know, crucifying the flesh. There, there exists from the moment you get saved a battle, which was not there before you got saved. Before you get saved, when you don't have a regenerated heart that loves Jesus, you just did whatever your unregenerated life wanted to do. And so therefore there's no conflict. And, and so people lived however they want to live. You understand this because before you came to know Christ, if you, especially if you came to know Christ a little bit later in life, there's a lot of stuff you did before you came to know Christ that you just did because it's what everybody else did. You're just gratifying your own flesh and, it, and it's no conflict, okay? Then you get saved. Now your moral conscience is awakened 
because of your love for Jesus and, and, and him living within you. And all of a sudden now you're conflicted. And some of your friends want, want you to go where you used to go. And you're like, ah, I'm not sure if I should go there anymore. And, and, and you know, you're thinking about doing some of the things you used to do. And you're like, ah, I'm not, ah, I don't think I should do that anymore. Because now this conscience factor kicks in. Because now you actually have a, this moral awareness and you have this heightened understanding of wanting to please God. And when you want to please God, you realize there's a lot of stuff that your flesh wants to do that is not pleasing to God. And so this is, this is the challenge for us as Christians. You know, Christians can go around, anybody can go around saying, this is what I believe. But your belief needs to match your behavior. And if it doesn't, you're a hypocrite. That's what it comes down to. It's not sincere. It's not a sincere faith. You know, sincere comes from two Latin words, sini kera. Sini meaning without and kera meaning wax. In the first century, when Romans, you know, would, would make these beautiful statues and chisel them out of granite and stuff, once in a while, the, the chisel in the hand of a chiseler would slip. And they would be making this beautiful statue out of granite, and all of a sudden, boink, off goes the nose. And I'm like, ah, you know, I just, I just made this beautiful statue of Aphrodite, and, and now she's missing a nose. What am I going to do? And here's what they would do. They would soften wax. And they would take the wax, and then they would do a little plastic surgery on Aphrodite, and they'd give her a nice, beautiful nose, and, and then they'd sell it like that. And you'd come along on the market, and you'd buy a little, if you, you know, weren't a Christian, obviously, you'd buy a statue of Aphrodite, and you'd put her in, in, the, in the front window of your house, and you'd think, this is beautiful, I paid a lot of money for this, everybody who walks by is going to see my beautiful statue for Aphrodite. And then the hot summer heat comes through the window. And all of a sudden, Aphrodite, you know, she's not as Aphrodite as, she, as you thought she was. Because now her nose is melted all down her face. And you're like, what's this? Oh, somebody made it with wax. So, sinicara is when it's legit. No wax. Okay? And this is what God calls us to be as Christians. No wax. No, nothing fake. That we have to be sincere and authentic in our relationship with Him. And this is challenging stuff. Because every single one of us, Truth be told, our flesh wants to dominate. Our flesh wants to rule. And and it's going to be a constant battle until the day we die and shed this body of flesh so that then we can fully be with a glorified body and our spirit combined with our glorified body in the presence of the Lord. No more temptation, no more battle from within because we are an undivided soul with a regenerated body in the presence of the Lord forever and ever. How many people are looking forward to that day? Amen? Amen. So, so this is where we're going here with First John. I know that was a bit lengthy, but let's pause here and let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the apostle John and just being inspired by your spirit to pen these things. And as we go through this epistle over the next couple of weeks, we pray that you would help us to really take these things personally. How is it, Lord, that what we believe may not be consistent with how we behave? And what are the things about our lives that you would, by your spirit, just gently challenge us about? How can we be walking more in ways that please you? Not gratifying the desires of our sinful nature, but dying to self and living for your glory. So help us in this battle, Lord, because it affects all of us. And sometimes, some days, the battle rages uh, harder than other days. Uh, Some days, it it feels like a battle that we aren't going to win, and other days, we... We seem to have the victory, and we just pray that you would help us, encourage us, strengthen us, and empower us. And as we look through this chapter, Lord, give us hearts to receive and believe and to put into practice what we read. And we love you and praise you together in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. First John 1, verse 1. He writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life 
was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. So that's his introduction here, first couple of verses. And in verse 1, back up where he says, that which was from the beginning, he's actually, you know, what beginning is he talking about? Well, he's, he's talking about two things. He's talking about Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God, okay? You don't have to go any further than that. In the beginning, God. And he's also referring to his own gospel, John 1-1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so between Genesis 1-1 and John 1-1, he's talking about the beginning. He's talking about as it relates to God, which, which we have heard. Now he's talking about being that personal eyewitness. I've heard, we've heard this. We've seen it with our eyes. We have looked upon and our hands have handled. Okay? He said, I, I've been there. I've seen it. I've, I've heard Jesus, I, I have seen him, I have touched him, I've looked upon him, our hands have handled concerning the word of life, circle the word life, and, and then in verse 2, the life, the life was manifested. So there's going to be a few things that uh, John says God is in, in 1 John. And here they are, I'm going I'm to give you all three right, right at the beginning, even though the last one doesn't come till chapter 4. And it's probably the most quoted one, it's the best known one. But the first one that, that John writes about here, that God is, is God is life. God is life. He, he, he says there, uh, concerning the word of life, I, am a, I can testify concerning the word of life. Verse 2, that life was manifested. And, and the word life is used 14 times in this little epistle of only five chapters. He's going he's gonna to put a heavy emphasis on life. Now, there are a couple of Greek words that, and the New Testament was written originally in Greek, that translate life. You have bios, we, we know that one, right? Biology, the study of life. That's physical life, natural life. You have suke, which is really the study of the soul, but it's sometimes translated in the Bible as life. And then you have the Greek word zoe. Z-O-E. And Zoe makes a, a pretty girl's name too, but Zoe in the Greek means um, life that is eternal, the fullness of life, the fullness of life. And, and Zoe, really, that kind of life we can only have through a personal relationship with the one who is life, that is the Lord. And so this is the kind of life that he's talking about here. Uh, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, Zoe. No man comes to the Father except through me. So even by Jesus' own testimony, if you really want to have the fullness of life, if you think to yourself, you know, I don't really feel like, you know, I, I feel like something's lacking in my life. That might be because you don't know Christ, because he is the fullness of life. And once you know him, you know fullness of life like you've never known before. Some people, some people have the opposite view. They think, you know, if, if I get serious about Jesus, he's going to kill my life. I'm not going to have a life. If I get serious with Jesus, I won't be able to do some of the things I used to do. You have, you have, you're being so robbed. It's like you think that drinking out of that nasty, bitter, muddy well is so refreshing. That's because you haven't tasted living water. Until you taste from the well that never runs dry, and you realize this, 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 this is water that I've been wanting all my life. I thought what I had was really great. No, what you have is that muddy, bitter stuff. That's a, that's a bad well, and you don't even know because you have nothing to compare it to. Until you know what Christ offers, the well you're drinking from you think is delicious, but when you taste of him, my, oh, my, there's nothing in comparison. So he is life. In John 1, 4, it said, John would write in his, in his gospel, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. So one of the things that he talks about here is, is life. Uh, we'll talk in a moment here about how God is light. And then I just want to touch on God is love, even though we won't get there till chapter 4, uh, just, just because, just as a kind of a, a, a fact about 1 John as it relates to love, the word love is found 45 times in 1 John alone, 45 times. 
Now listen to me on this. That is more times in, the, in 1 John than any other book of the Bible. And it's only five chapters. Now, the exception is the book of Psalms. It has 150 chapters, but the word love only appears 141 times in the book of Psalms. So even proportionally, then, it means that 1 John talks about love even more than the book of Psalms, more than any other book of the Bible. It is a major theme, and every single time the word love is used in 1 John, it is the Greek word agape. As most of you know, there are different words in the Greek for the word love. In English, you know, it's, it's kind of sad, because in English, it's, it, our language is kind of deficient in some ways, and especially in the word love, because we, we, we say, you know, I love ice cream, and then we say, I love my wife, or I love my husband, right? Well, I hope you love your husband or wife more than you love ice cream, but we only have one word. So we say, oh, I love Fridays. I love my kids. I hope a little bit more than Fridays, you know? But, the, but in the Greek language, they were brilliant. So they had different words, like uh, storge is um, family love. Eros is erotic love. Um, phileo is brotherly love. Philadelphia is a city of brotherly love. Or my friend from Philly says the city of brotherly shove. But anyway, and then, you have, and then you have agape, which is this highest supreme love. And every time, all 45 times that the word love is used in 1 John, it is always agape. It's talking about this highest form of love that we can only really know in a personal relationship with the Lord. So, he is these things, and so, you know, back here now, uh, we'll, we'll get at least uh, tonight to how he is light. But, but he, he talks here about how God is love, uh, rather, God is life in verse 2, and that life was manifested. So, the manifestation of, of God's life comes uh, uh, present in, in Jesus. That's why he adds there in verse 2, we've seen, we bear witness, declare to you that eternal life this fullness of life, Zoe, which was with the Father and was manifested to us through the person of Jesus, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship. You can circle that word fellowship. That word is used four times in 1 John, twice right here, uh, because he, he says that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship, there's a the word again, is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And it is that Greek word koinonia. We, we name our small group uh, ministry after Koinonia, so we call them K-groups, our K-group Bible study that meets in homes, because it's the idea, again, of this kind of fellowship that you can only really have in this relationship with Christ. Have you ever gone somewhere? I, I can tell you personally, like Terry and I, this past summer, I was invited to speak in Thailand at this uh, missions congress, and there were, there were people, a few hundred people there from all over the world, okay? And they even had uh, about six different languages that were being translated. They had translators in the back of the room translating as I'm speaking and in the earpieces of people, just like at the UN kind of a thing. It was just a marvelous thing. But, you know, and, and here we walk into a group of a few hundred people from all over the world that we'd never met before, and some of whom we don't even speak their language. And yet I can tell you, it's that instant friendship and fellowship and like brothers and sisters and, and you've never even met these people. And, and the first time you meet them, it's just like what, you have that special common bond and fellowship. Why is that? It's koinonia because it's based on Christ. So you can meet basically a complete stranger and they know Christ and you know Christ and you instantly have a kind of fellowship that just transcends all other kinds of things that, that normally divide other, other people that, that shouldn't divide us in the body of Christ. And you come together under the umbrella and fellowship of Jesus. That's the kind of koinonia that he's talking about here. It's with, his fa it's with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Verse 5, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, so here's the other thing, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Okay, now he's gonna move in this section here using this language about light and darkness and he, and he tells us here that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. You know, it's interesting, um, Albert Einstein in, in the um, um, theory of relativity, he was talking about how 
uh, if you could travel at the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second, he said, if, if you could travel at the speed of light, time ceases to be. And he was once asked, how many people understand this? And he said, me and one other person. And they said, who's that other person? He said, I haven't met him yet. <laughs> 186,000 miles per second, he said, if you could travel at the speed of light, time ceases to be. You see, God is light, and He's outside of time. God, God is not restricted by space and time. He's outside of the time-space continuum. Now, He made a decision 2,000 years ago to enter that continuum, to come into our, our order of space and time by taking on flesh and dwelling among us in the person of Jesus. But outside of his entry into the world, into the human race, taking on flesh, dying for our sins, God is outside of time. He's, he's not restricted by time. He, 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 he's not measured in terms of time. There is no beginning with him. There is no ending with him. So it's interesting even, you know, basically, you know, science, not that we need science to validate the Bible, right? I always believe that eventually science will catch up with the Bible. But it's always interesting to, to note something that John says there in terms of, you know, God is light and in him is no darkness. And, and then Einstein comes along and says, you know, if we could travel at the speed of light, there is no time. And it's consistent with what Scripture teaches here. But he uses this terminology here about light and darkness because in, in the next uh, verse he's going to say, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness... We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So he starts to use this terminology here about light and darkness to communicate who God is. God is light. God is outside of time. And here we are. Uh, we're in darkness. You know, before, before we get saved, certainly, we're walking in darkness. Uh, in John 8, verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So, you know, all this terminology is used, used to describe the Lord and describe our relationship with him. And, and so Jesus comes along and says, listen, I'm the light of the world. If you, you, you're in fellowship with me, you, you won't be in darkness. It's interesting because there is something true, pure, right, unashamed, good, and clean about the light versus when you think about darkness you know at nighttime darkness there's something sinister there's something evil there's something wicked and shameful and fearful and secretive about living in in the darkness you know at night you know think about it you never had to tell your kids to be afraid of the dark and you were too when you were a kid why is that why is there this this fear attached to, you know, like darkness. It's, it's because there's something about the darkness that, that there's, there's this kind of, you know, seedy thing that happens in the darkness. Think about when most crime occurs. Most crime, except and, unless some criminal is really brazen, doesn't occur in the daytime. It occurs under the cover of darkness. It occurs at nighttime. Think about, you know, things that, that come out in the dark. You know, rats and bats. And cats, you know, just all of those things that just does evil things that just keep crawling out, you know, at, at nighttime. Uh, every scary movie you've ever watched, the setting was at nighttime. It was all in the darkness because there's something about the darkness that, that, is, that just presents itself in, in this way. So this is why the Bible uses this terminology. You know, what's the difference between a butterfly and a cockroach? Light and darkness. You know, one comes out at the light, oh, this is beautiful, oh, and then one is like, nee, 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 through your cupboard in the dark. And as soon as you, you know, if there's a cockroach in your house and you open up the cabinet, they scurry, you know, because light has come. And so, you know, they flee. And you, and you would think that most people would want to come into the light when, when it, where it concerns the Lord, where things are pure and true and good and right, but not everyone wants to. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 3, 19 to 21, he says, this is the verdict Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done 
through God. So Jesus says, unfortunately, you know, I've come into the world, light has come into the world, but there's gonna be a lot of people that just love darkness more than light. They're more comfortable under the cover of darkness, doing what they do, rather than coming into the light. It can be a very vulnerable and terrifying thing to come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. You know why a lot of people don't want to come into the light? For that reason. They feel like if they do, then the shame will be too much. Now, unfortunately, that might be true in human relationships where if you come clean about something and the response is, a lot of shame and guilt, then you're gonna, then you're gonna think to yourself, why, why did I even come clean if I'm gonna get all this shame and guilt? But with God, it's never like that. When we come into the light, and we, he's gonna say later in this chapter, when we confess our sins, you know, when, when, we, when we get right with him, and we come into the light, there's this cleansing, purifying, liberating thing that happens that is the result of a very open and vulnerable encounter with Jesus. And since he knows everything anyway, it's not like we're, it's not like we're gonna shock him when we come into the light and Jesus is gonna be, <gasps> I didn't know that. It's not gonna be any of that. He already knows what he wants us to do is just come clean and come into the light. But this is why John says here in verse six, if, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now there's gonna be a few uh, uh, things, false teachings and, and wrong assumptions and false claims and kind of, again, kind of, it stems out of Gnosticism, but, but that John refutes, and, and this is one of them. One of the things that he's refuting right here in this passage is the idea that we can have fellowship with God regardless of our actions. Again, you know, with Gnosticism, it was like, well, the, the body doesn't really matter, so we can do whatever we want. And so we translate it into our own culture today, and what he's saying here in verse six is that, you know, we, we can't go around saying we have fellowship with God, we, we're close to him, we know him, we're walking with the Lord, and walking in the darkness at the same time because that means we lie and we don't practice the truth. But here's, here's the remedy though, verse seven. This is what I was talking about a moment ago about, about being vulnerable and coming into the light. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, because he is light, we have fellowship with one another, okay? Because there's nothing that hinders horizontal relationships like living in darkness, as well as the vertical relationship, it hinders it when we walk in darkness, okay? So when we come into the light, when we get right with the Lord, we have fellowship with one another, that isn't hindered on the horizontal, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Isn't that beautiful? Just, he, he's telling us, listen, when we come and we step into the light and we, and we say, okay, Lord, you see anyway, you know anyway, I just want to get right with you. I don't want to be living in secrecy and in darkness. I don't, I don't want to be living a, a hypocritical or duplicitous life where I'm, you know, I, I believe one thing, but I have, behave differently. I want, Lord, to just be right with you and come clean with you. And you step into that light. Oh, how our sins are cleansed. His son cleanses us from how much sin? A little? All. Circle that in your Bibles. Cleanse us from all sin. Not, not a little bit, not a couple, all sin. And so he, he refutes that false claim that you can have fellowship and still just behave however you want. He's like, no, 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 no. No, you gotta come into the light. You gotta be right with the Lord. It's gotta be, you gotta be true with him. And, but the bonus is that the blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross, his atoning sacrifice cleanses us from all sin when we do that. No shame. He doesn't shame us. He cleanses us. And then here's, here's the second thing. We'll, we'll just tackle this real quickly and then close out chapter one for tonight. The second thing that he refutes here between verses eight and 10, if you look at this with me, he says, if we say, and that's always the lead in clause, like verse six was, if we say, 
And now here again in verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, this is the remedy, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then he ties it in again in verse 10 by saying, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him, that's God, a liar, and his word is not in us. And so basically the second thing that he refutes here is this idea that, that we're not sinners. He says, yes, we are. He says, if, if, we, if we say we have no sin, that's verse 8, so that's inherent sin. And in verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, that's, a, that's acquired. So one is like denying the sin nature, and the other is denying sin practices. So I'm not, I don't sin. You know, it's because, again, Gnosticism was kind of the root of this. It's just like, well, the body doesn't really count for anything. So no matter what I do with my body, it's not really sin. It's all about the spirit. And so now that I'm, you know, saved, it's only about my spirit. And thus, I can't really sin anyway because all that other sinful stuff happens in my body. And the body doesn't count for anything. So it's very twisted, but he's just reminding us of the general sin nature that we all have. We're all born into sin. David writes about in the Psalms about how surely I was uh, in sin from the time I was conceived in my mother's womb. We inherit a sin nature because Adam sinned. The human race got spoiled and every descendant of Adam has now been spoiled and our nature is sinful. That's why when we're born, as soon as we are able to walk or talk or do anything, we, we just gravitate right to our sinful nature. You know, a little kids, they do stuff that's sinful. They're just, you know, you might think to yourself, well, you know, I think only that's not really fair. Little kids, they do things innocently. No, they don't. No, they don't. You must not have kids. I can remember reading a book with Tyler when he was about three years old. And he had taken a book, which I didn't know until I'm turning the pages. He had taken a crayon and scribbled all over it. Okay, that's fine. Kids do that all the time. That's not sin by itself, right? Kids do, kids do that. But as I'm reading the book with him, and I turn the page, and I see scribble all over it. I'm like, whoa. I said, Tyler, who did this? And he looked at the scribble, and he looked at me, and he said, Mommy did that. <laughs> that's sin right there. All right, that is sin right there. And I turned out okay, praise God. But I'm just saying, nobody had to teach him. Now listen, listen, when I turn the page and there's scribble marks, you blame it on mommy. Where'd that come from? A sinful heart. It's not just adults. Kids are just short sinners. They're sinners too. <laughs> because we're born into sin and so we sin. So he says, don't deny that we have a sinful nature and don't deny that along the way, even as Christians, our flesh will get the best of us and sometimes we sin. But here's the good news that is sandwiched right between verse 8 and verse 10, which talks about the sin nature and the sin practices. Verse 9 says, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen and amen. So that's where we will leave it tonight. You can read ahead. We'll, we have much more there than the little epistle of 1 John, but let's give thanks to the Lord tonight and, and just pray as we leave. Father, thank you for your grace and your forgiveness. Thank you as we step into the light, you cleanse us. Thank you when we confess our sins, you're faithful and just, you forgive us of all our sins. You cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help us, Lord, to walk in ways that are pleasing to you. That as we live out our faith, it would be evident, not just to you, supremely to you, but also to others who will look on our lives and be able to tell that we're different because we want to live in a way that brings glory to you, not gratifying our flesh, not doing things we used to do before we got saved, but following after you and living in such a way that brings you glory and honor and praise. But Lord, our flesh always wants to get the best of us, so help us in our battle against the flesh. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit to empower us and help us to live out our lives in such a way that brings praise to you. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.